Welcome back, folks. We are officially back, and by we, I mean the Movie Nerd Podcast. Yes, it has been off the air for quite some time now, but I am happy to say that after a couple months of hiatus in terms of trying to get this thing back on the air, we are back. It is me and my new partner, Connor Brennan. Connor, introduce yourself. Hello there. My name is Connor Brennan, and I'm happy to be here today. Yeah, I'm happy to be here as well, and if none of you remember me, which it's perfectly understandable if you don't remember me, this is Dominic Rizzi, a.k.a. the Movie Nerd, known better online as Movie Nerd. Again, I like repeating myself. Connor can attest to that. I'm not really sure why I enjoy doing that, but just to kind of give you a breakdown on the first five episodes of the podcast that I did back in my hometown, I like to call it the podcast that you've never heard of from a suburb that you've never heard of, I kind of broke down... You know, maybe I went a little bit more specific with it. I did topics that really appealed to me at a certain time period with my old partner, Christian Ivanko. The problem is, is that with uh, that relationship, you know, when you're in your hometown, when you're trying to get things together, plans don't always line up. You always got your own thing going on. But now that we are here at SUNY Oswego, we are going to get this thing back on track we're going to have a lot of fun with it. Now, the format for this is going to be a little different than what we've usually done, which is where in the past we mostly just turned out an episode whenever. Now we're going to try and have a little bit more consistency with it, but it's going to be a monthly podcast, not a weekly podcast, unfortunately. So that'll kind of make it easier on both of us, wouldn't you say so? Yeah, I think it would. Yeah, so that'll kind of make it easier on us just in terms of like keeping track of news overall. That way we don't have to constantly jump over it. We can also cover some of the trailers and some of the movies that we've seen that month. We could also cover some major news stories that happened in the month. One in particular that has rocked the past month and honestly the past couple of months. I mean, Hollywood has always been in a sad state of affairs since kind of last year when movie just every blockbuster movie started sucking again. Once again, continuing my theory that this whole decade has been a repeat of the 90s, but the overall level of tragedy that's been happening in Hollywood concerning sexual harassment and just the fact of it's finally getting a light shown on it, showing that some people who we thought we knew are not necessarily the people that we thought, and it is in fact also hit kind of close to home in terms of me, because as we both know, Honest Trailers and Screen Junkies overall, a company that I have been very closely following since my high school years, was another one of the things that was rocked by this. And I'm really glad that it's finally starting to come to light because it shows that sexual harassment in any way, any form, is not okay. There's no excuse for it. And nobody should be able to get away with that. And all these excuses that all these assholes are coming up with now... It's not okay, and people are finally starting to see through all their bullshit. So we're going to get into that a little bit later. But for right now, what we're going to do just for kind of the – just to overall break down the podcast format further is – so the first half – so it's going to be a two-hour podcast every month. And what we're going to do is for the first half hour of every – thing of every new episode that comes out at the end of the month we will break down all the trailers and kind of news stories that came out for this month then for the second half hour of the first hour we will cover all of the movies that we saw in that month now we may not necessarily do that in that specific order depending on how much content is required for each section but that'll be kind of the basic breakdown and then we'll have about a 10 to 20 minute break and then once we come back for the second hour it'll mostly just be me and Connor kind of shooting the shit talk about something we want to it could be an old movie it could talk about a genre it could talk about really anything that we feel like discussing because this is our podcast not yours so yeah um, we're we're here the movie nerd podcast is back and uh we're gonna have a lot of fun Connor you have uh anything you want to contribute before we get going well I think you pretty much summed it up I say we get started. All right, let's do this. All right, so first things first is we're going to start to cover some of the trailers that came out in the month of October. So this is the October podcast. So just kind of a breakdown of a lot of the trailers that came out this month for blockbusters. You've also got some independent trailers that came out this month. So some of the trailers that I have listed here are you've got 
the new Black Panther trailer. You've got the first official trailer for the new Mutants, which is the next X-Men movie that's coming out before Deadpool 2. You've got the another trailer for Justice League. You've got the new trailer for Star Wars The Last Jedi. And then also, in terms of just more independent, Oscar-worthy movies, you've got The Disaster Artist. You have Phantom Thread. And those are just a couple that are off the top of my head. So, Connor, did you get a chance to actually watch any of these trailers? I watched all of them, yes. You were helpful with that. Oh, thank you. And um, so, just kind of diving right in. So, let, let's start with the Black Panther trailer, first off. I, 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 we, I just saw, we both just saw Thor Ragnarok um, this Friday. Yeah, and uh, kind of... A lot of the problems that we've been having with a lot of previous Marvel movies in terms of, you know, no stakes, a lot of jokes, really underdeveloped, forgettable side characters. And villains. And villains. But that's been a thing since the beginning. Yeah. But overall, just what what really felt like it was missing the most in this movie is this movie, it didn't feel memorable on its own and it just felt like more holdover material until Infinity War. And that's kind of a worry that I've been having because it's kind of been happening with a lot of their Phase 3 movies and it's something that I thought of they would have fixed by now after, you know, some of the mistakes that I thought they made in Phase 2. But clearly that's not the case. I gotta say, though, this Black Panther trailer, it actually really impressed me. Me too. Like, I mean, one thing I'm not so sure about is the use of uh, I'm you have to tell me what kind of music it, it is again oh yeah it's a, a hip-hop rap music oh, okay hip-hop rap music sometimes I can't tell the difference of but course. anyway I'm not so sure about that but the trailer certainly did look promising but of course uh, it's the same with quite a few Marvel trailers that have come out I mean Ant-Man for instance uh, that first trailer that looked pretty promising but the movie turned out good but honestly it could have been better but that's a whole nother story of course but i have to say that at least with this trailer what i found is that so we both know that marvel has had a very long history of not utilizing the creative talents of some of their directors that they have because as you know it feels more so like a tv series where each one of these brilliant directors that they bring on is treated more of like a TV director where they're not really brought in to express their own creative talents. They're brought in to work within a system that satisfied the overall need of the conglomerate executives, that being Marvel overlord Kevin Feige. And sometimes that's worked. It's given us some of the better movies, like you know with the Russos, with Civil War, or James Gunn with Guardians of the Galaxy. So it has worked before, but yeah. for the most part, it really hasn't. And it's ended up causing a lot of great directors' talents to seem really wasted. Yes, and the sad thing is, like, uh, with Phase 3 now, this is all starting to become much more apparent. I mean, with Phase 1, I think, actually think most of the Phase 1 movies were, were good, at least. I mean, Iron Man and Avengers were the standouts, but, but if you had something bad like Iron Man 2, or in Phase 2, Thor The Dark World, which was probably one of the bottom three MCU films. Which, ironically enough, was also directed by a director who is mostly known for doing TV work. Yeah, those those felt like flukes, like unfortunate flukes. They didn't stand out amongst the rest. But here, the lack of creativity and, and just everything wrong with Marvel is really starting to seep through. I thought this would be their most creative phase yet, what, with Thor and Hulk battling gods and monsters in this new film, and... Spider-Man and Iron Man being in the same film, but this is turning out to be the most disappointing phase. It really is, because I feel like every movie that's come out after Civil War has just been disappointing. Like, you get a great director like Scott Derrickson, who floored the world with the, in, in the world of horror with Sinister, and then Doctor Strange ends up being just another generic, mediocre origin story that feels like a mix with between Iron Man and Ant-Man, but with all the fun and joy sucked out of it. Then you get Guardians 2, which at best is a haphazard sequel follow-up and again you get James Gunn with that insane creativity and hilarious one-liners but the problem with that movie is it really just feels like a sitcom in terms of it really doesn't have a plot or an overall story or focus and it just feels like a series of events that happen one right after another until the last act where it feels like it has to follow like generic Marvel third act where it throws a ton of CG at your face and the villain who Kurt Russell does a pretty good job in that movie, ends up becoming generic Marvel villain number whatever. Yeah, and also the finale, at least part of it, ended up just being Star-Lord and uh, 
ego, Kurt Russell, uh, flying in the air and punching each other, Man of Steel style, repeatedly. Now, granted, that did give us some entertaining moments. I do have to say the Pac-Man moment was pretty entertaining. But yeah, you see what I... And then with Spider-Man, it's more so a matter of... Because that movie has so... Despite the fact that all the good that did come out of that movie and the fact of, yeah, it is one of the better Spider-Man movies we've gotten, especially after the last two that we got, <sighs> with... With just the movie has six writers, tonally it feels all over the place. And despite the fact that even though it does have one of the best Marvel villains we've gotten, there's just so much wasted talent in that movie, so much potential that it feels like that movie could go for that it just feels like it's missing out on. And, and then following it up with Thor, just overall, Phase 3 has just not been a very creative phase for Marvel, which sucks because it had so much promise going in. But with Black Panther, I'm really hoping that Black Panther could be the one that kind of, you know, follows up with the promise of Civil War and being really good because it is directed by a director that both Connor and I love, mostly because he broke out two years ago by making a sequel, or rather a next installment in one of our favorite film franchises. That would, of course, be Ryan Coogler with Creed, which is one of, both, if I'm not mistaken, in our top 10 favorite movies of 2015. It is. Like, just the overall creative flair and the style that he's able to do. And the fact that this guy was actually able to convince Sylvester Stallone, who did not want to come back and do that movie, to come back to this franchise and arguably give the best performance as the character of Rocky Balboa that he's given since the first movie. For that reason alone, I feel like Coogler, I kind of already knew was going to be a standout. And obviously, just for the fact of the movie is going to be one of the first superhero movies ever to feature a primarily black cast. Like, just the fact that we're seeing that now... It really goes to show you how far things have come in terms of, the, you know, the way that movies are made. And so when I saw the trailer, I thought that there was kind of an overall creative tone in here that I feel was missing from a lot of the other movies. And maybe that has to do with the overall black influence of it. But just the styles, the, the, the CG, it still looks fake, but again, it's trailer CG, so you can't really match it up to the final product. But it just overall has this really awesome sense of self an identity that a lot of the other Marvel movies have been missing. I'm hoping. At least that's what I get from the trailer. That certainly does seem to be the case. And uh, there was actually very little humor thrown in, unlike a lot of other Marvel trailers. Yeah, there were maybe one or two that didn't exactly stick out, but eh, this could be a sign that things may be going in the right direction. I'm especially interested to see what they're going to do with Andy Serkis's Ulysses Claw, because... And he appeared in Age of Ultron, albeit very briefly, and in the comics, he's the one who actually kills Black Panther's father. Which clearly that didn't happen here, because if anybody saw Civil War, you know how his father died in there. But the point being that, yeah, I am looking forward to this movie. The, the cast that they have assembled is friggin' spectacular. Like, besides, obviously, Chadwick coming back as... T'Challa, the Black Panther, one of the standouts of Civil War. Mm -hmm. um, Lupita Nyong'o and Denai Guerrera as his two two members of his Dora Milaje, which are kind of like his personal bodyguards. Uh, Michael B. Jordan is the bad guy, even though it kind of does throw me off that he's the only one in the movie that doesn't have an African accent, and I found that kind of hilarious. He's I him him and Coog every time him and Coogler have teamed up in the past, which B. Jordan has been in both of Coogler's previous movies, Creed, and then um, Coogler's directorial debut, Fruitvale Station, which I have yet to see, but I've heard that he is amazing in that. Just the, every time that these two have worked together, it has been gold. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what he does as the villain. And hopefully he won't be another wasted opportunity. Again, continuing, Andy Serkis. Can we just talk about the fact that Andy Serkis is in three movies this year? Like, th that makes me so happy on so many different levels. Because the guy who has become known for getting snubbed for Oscars in terms of giving, like, some of the best performances that we've ever seen for motion capture and revolutionizing the motion capture the, the way the motion capture is viewed in Hollywood, just, that makes me so happy to see how much work this guy is getting and how popular and how loved he is getting. And he also just seems like the nicest guy in real life, too, which always helps when, like, one of your idols is actually a nice guy, especially with, you know, some of the, um, some of the more nasty stuff that's coming out about celebrities' personal lives. But... Um, yeah, Forrest Whitaker, Angela Bassett, Daniel Kaluuya from Get Out, Sterling K. Brown, who killed it in both People vs. OJ and This Is Us, one of the better breakout stars of last year. Just the cast looks great. The visual style and flair looks great. It looks, 
it, it looks promising and it looks like it's getting back to Marvel of old and I'm like I said my big hope is that it manages to stand out on its own and not feel like more holdover until Infinity War the way Thor Ragnarok did so that's kind of our breakdown of the Black Panther trailer now moving on to the Next one we have, which is switching studios for a second over to a studio that I would say for the most part over the last few years has actually been having more success critically, in my opinion, than Marvel. I feel like we can both agree, and that would be 20th Century Fox, because despite the fluke that was X-Men Apocalypse, which was absolute garbage, I think we can both agree. And I just love the fact of how, like, when I came out of that movie the first time a year ago, almost two years ago now, wow, it's been almost two years since that movie came out. The fact of the matter was is that everybody was like for the most part really enjoying that movie and I was I felt like I was the only one out in terms of complaining just like this movie is absolute garbage and now it's like everybody's realizing yeah that movie sucks and that makes me really happy. Yeah, like I will admit that I am sort of guilty of enjoying it when I first saw it in the theater because I was so enthralled by Days of Future Past. I wanted to see a proper follow-up. I was sort of disappointed at first when I realized that a lot of the old cast wouldn't be returning because they're the ones who attracted me to the franchise in the first place. Although, of course, Hugh Jackman was in there because he's Wolverine and you can't go one X-Men movie without having him. But the more I thought about the film, the more disappointing it got. Yeah, exactly. But the point being that... After the tragic mishap that was X-Men Apocalypse, Fox surprised both of us because Deadpool, as you all know, proved to be a massive success for Fox. And then we found out that they were gonna that they were gonna make the final Wolverine film in the solo Wolverine trilogy rated R. And that of course led to both of our well, not no longer mine, but both of our favorite movies of the year this year, Logan, which still now, almost a year later, is one of the best movies we've seen all year just in terms of showing that superhero movies don't have to be just kiddie fair and fun and really kind of sticking it to Marvel in terms of showing that superhero movies can still be taken seriously. Yeah, and it, when we got out of Thor Ragnarok, I was thinking exactly what Wolverine was earlier in, in Logan about the comic books. Ice cream for bedwetters. Yeah, so... Um, so Fox, it looks like it's starting to continue that trend of that, of you know, not just doing rated R movies, but like really trying to be more creative and play with different genres. What Marvel says they've been doing, which really they haven't been, because let's face it, all of their movies are exactly the same tonally. And no matter what they say their genre changes, there really isn't a genre shift. But Fox has really been delivering on that. And they really delivered on that with their next trailer, which again looks like a complete change up of tones with The New Mutants, which despite the fact that that movie is rated PG-13 and is directed by Josh Boone of all people, the guy who did The Fault in Our Stars, that movie looks like a serious horror movie that like doesn't even remotely resemble a superhero movie, which really kind of shocks and fascinates me and makes me want to see the movie just to see if it actually can hold up to the promise that was set by those trailers. Yeah, to be honest, uh, this whole horror tone uh, reminds me of, and by the way, I haven't seen Fan Stick yet. I don't know if I ever will. Probably but, a better idea to skip that one. But anyway, I mean, that Fan Stick, in the, at least in the scenes where the team gets first gets their powers, it's been compared to something out of a David Cronenberg body horror film. And I'm getting the impression that that sort of tone is going to be repeated here. Maybe not exactly body horror, because these are still mutants with powers, but I on honestly, I don't know what to think after watching the trailer. I mean, a horror film tone has never been tried in a superhero movie before. It'd be an interesting experiment, but in terms of Josh Boone as a director, if Fault in Our Stars is the only movie it's done so far, I right? I believe so. I'm, if that's the case, then it's kind of shocking to go from a mostly lighthearted, although later heartbreaking, uh, romantic teen film to this. Yeah, and again, like we will, I mean, if we're just talking about Fox, like Fox has been known to do that before, obviously with how good of a job Tim Miller did with Deadpool, though we both know that Deadpool's success is mostly attributed to Ryan Reynolds and those writers, Rhett Reese and Paul Warnock, who just absolutely killed it, but... If, even though this movie isn't rated R, it is unfortunately rated PG-13. Just if, if they can if they can follow up this is the critical and commercial success of both Deadpool and Logan, like Fox 
will officially be back in the game, in my opinion, actually, at number one in terms of really making sure that the superhero genre sticks around. Because unfortunately, despite what a lot of people may say, superhero fatigue is starting to become a thing, primarily because of Marvel, and they really need to start stepping up their game if they want to, you know, stick around and be relevant. And because otherwise, it's just going to be Fox, you know, kind of killing it in terms of doing these smaller independent movies that or independent feeling movies that have a lower budget, not as many special effects, great writing, and more character driven works. Also, not getting as many big name actors so that way they don't have to pay them as much and spend so much money. Like I said, not as much CGI, so not as big a budget. And what do you know? It could show that these movies can still churn a profit. Take notes, Kevin Feige. Yes, well, uh, for some, actually, I know the reason why Marvel is. Uh, immune to the superhero fatigue at least so far it's because disney they're they're the ones that are in charge and uh, they promote lazy storytelling to cash in on our nostalgia but that's beside the point so fox has uh, actually it helped start the whole modern superhero genre with x-men and i actually think with a few exceptions, X-Men Apocalypse being one of them. The series has overall been very good, and it stood out from a lot of the other superhero franchises that have come out over the years, and it's only fair that they should be given a chance to get back in the game. Yeah, and just also if we're looking at the cast that we've got here, like I love the batch of kids that they've gotten for the, this movie. Obviously, my girl from Game of Thrones, Maisie Williams, another Game of Thrones star that's getting into the X-Men franchise as Rain Sinclair, a.k.a. Wolvesbane. You've also got Anya Taylor-Joy, who just recently killed it earlier this year with Split and last year with The Witch as Ileana Rasputin, a.k.a. Magic. And the other three in there, you've got Charlie Heaton as Sam Guthrie, a.k.a. Cannonball, Henry Zaga as Rebecca. Roberto DaCosta, a.k.a. Sunspot, who was previously portrayed by a different actor in X-Men Daisy Future Past, and Blue Hunt as uh, Daniel Moonstar. And just the fact of the matter of that we're finally getting to see these characters who I think we can both agree have, we never would have thought we would be able to get on the big screen in just like this different type of a horror genre. It really... It, it really shows that it, it continues to play around with the idea of, you know, the X-Men franchise has always been known for really being the one that kind of embodies, you know, real world issues because the X-Men franchise going all the way back to the comics in the 60s has always been kind of that great metaphor for, you know, everything that real world, real world events. Like, obviously, the whole dichotomy between Professor X and Magneto has always been the relationship between the, the uh, dichotomy between Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X and how the whole idea of mutants is supposed to be an allegory for racism. And for the most part, the movies have done a really good job with that. And if this continues to play around with that in terms of just, you know, showing these guys how the, these mutants are experimented on and made to think that there's really something wrong with them, it, it, it shows a lot of promise. And it makes me really excited to see what's in store for it. So... Now, moving on from New Mutants, so another trailer for, you know, again, with mostly superheroes, because everything is superheroes now, kind of jumping ship to the third major studio that somehow has still managed to remain relevant despite the, the two disastrous movies that they put out last year. That would, of course, be Warner Brothers and their newest trailer for Justice League. So, Connor, it is no secret that Batman vs. Superman and Suicide Squad were both critical flops and that we both hated those movies, or you at least well, hated one. I, I have yet to see Suicide Squad, but I absolutely despise Batman v Superman. It's actually I'm it's actually my least favorite superhero film of all time. So much so that when I wrote my review on IMDB, I felt like I was putting a dark curse on the film and the whole DC cinematic universe at the end of it. Well for the most part, it looks like your curse has not held up because, thank Christ, earlier in the summer, we finally got a DC movie that was good, we can both say. Looking back, it's definitely not as great, you know, a great movie, but I think with us, it was just we were mostly relieved that we finally got a DC movie that didn't completely suck, and that would be Wonder Woman. And I honestly think it's what Man of Steel should have been in terms of character arcs and the overall tone of it. Most definitely. So, 
Now, we all knew that Justice League was coming because, again, Warner Brothers, it has been no secret that they have been trying desperately to play catch up with Marvel and immediately copy the success in only two years that Marvel, it took them almost four to achieve. And so they tried to jump right in with Batman versus Superman. That turned out to be a mess, but they had to keep going with it. But then Wonder Woman came out. And DC realized, okay, we actually might have a chance to save this. So now we all know what also happened behind the scenes with Justice League in terms of Zack Snyder's daughter committing suicide and him stepping away from the project and Joss Whedon taking it over. Now, at first, this worried me even more because I felt like it would cause a massive shift of tones in the movies because as we both know, Zack Snyder and Joss Whedon are two people that have very, very different tones when it comes to their movies and their styles of filmmaking. And... Uh the president of DC Films uh, recently admitted that the company's view on how this uni cinematic universe should turn out was pretty different from what Zack Snyder envisioned. Yeah, exactly. And just overall, really, really, I, I was worried for, about this movie. But then I saw this newest trailer. And despite the fact that I have been kind of getting sick of the overuse of CG in these movies, I actually took a step back. And, you know, really started to pay attention. And I'm like, okay, wait. This movie might actually have some promise. Especially because there was a series of clips from the movie that were released online. And I gotta say, I may have changed my tune. And I might actually be looking forward to this movie now. I have yet to see those clips. But I certainly will in a short amount of time. And hopefully I'll understand what my partner here means. Because, honestly, after... Two disastrous Superman movies, Man of Steel and Batman v Superman. I kind of lost my faith in the DCEU, or DC Extended Universe as it's called. Wonder Woman did help uh, change my tune a little. So with Justice League, I'm still a little skeptical because it seemed like from this latest trailer they were trying to capture an Avengers vibe, especially with Aquaman acting in a way similar to Thor in The Avengers. At, that's the impression I got, at least. Of course. I'm not sure what uh, Batman is, would be, like maybe this team's Iron Man or something. I mean, they are similar characters anyway. Yeah. But I just hope it's not going to be a carbon copy of Avengers. Yeah, which um, I don't think it will be, but the point being that I am a lot more... I'm looking forward to this movie a lot more than I was originally a couple months ago. Like, wh like when that first trailer came out at Comic-Con last year, when, back when Snyder was still on board, I was selling this movie. I was like, this movie is going to be the worst movie of this year. I couldn't care less about this movie. Then you had the whole mishap. Then you had Joss Whedon step on. And overall, I would say that the future for DC actually looks just a little bit brighter. So we're starting to run a little bit low on time on this segment. So we're kind of just going to jump into our last trailer, and then we're going to do... And then we're going to we're gonna spend this next half hour talking about the new segment because I feel like that kind of takes precedence. So we're going to jump into the last major trailer that dropped in the month of October. And that would be the trailer for, again, jumping back over to Disney and capitalizing on our nostalgia, the trailer for the next Star Wars trailer, The Last Jedi. You mean the next Star Wars movie. Uh, yeah, exactly. So it's no secret that Disney is really prioritizing nostalgia and selling toys over actual good storytelling. Yes, and uh, to all you out there who went to see the Beauty and the Beast remake, even though it was mostly the same film as the 1991 animated version, um, I have only one thing to say to you. Bow your heads in shame. You prove that Disney is brainwashing you. I mean, that's kind of always been the case with Disney. Is like Disney made literally has made its money on brainwashing us. Yeah, but it's outrageous because now Beauty and the Beast, the new one, is one of the highest grossing films of all time. Yeah, the point being that Disney has kind of settled into that spot of they are pretty much box office and critically immune. Like, they, like their movies are literally critic proof because, again, it doesn't matter what type of critiques they get because everybody is going to go and see their movies regardless. Yeah, I'm starting to think that... Maybe they're bribing critics, just like I I felt the same way about Sony and Blade Runner 2049. I mean, it wasn't just Sony who made that film, but Sony is distributing the film internationally, and they own Rotten Tomatoes, so ev everyone follows Rotten Tomato ratings now, which is sometimes sad, but 
anyone's going to see a good Rotten Tomatoes rating, they'll naturally want to go see a film, right? Well, with Blade Runner 2049, that wasn't the case, and I'm actually glad because we both saw the movie and we think it's really overrated. Yeah, like, I still would love to see what exactly it is that people like about this movie but the point being that i wouldn't necessarily say that disney is bribing critics because again the, despite the fact that the films have done enormously well box office wise there are still a decent amount of critics that i've seen that don't think their movies are all that cracked up to be we ourselves just had a debate on whether on w which star wars movie we liked better force awakens versus rogue one but the point being that the latest trailer for their next movie the last jedi dropped and it's been no secret that Ryan Johnson, the new director of the movie, has come out and said this movie is going to be dark and different and truly a different Star Wars movie than we've ever gotten, which I hope to Christ that that's true. But I think it's just that we've been led astray a little bit too many times in the past now in terms of just, okay, The Force Awakens, say what you will about how much we enjoyed it. It still was essentially borrowing a lot of elements from the first Star Wars movie. In places, certainly. Exactly. And I'm just, I really hope that that's not the case with The Last Jedi, but with this trailer, it was mostly more so a fact of that just angered me is the fact of the Star, the Star Wars trailers for the last two movies, Force Awakens and Rogue One, have been really, really good about not giving you anything concerning the plots of the movie. Like, it, it shows you the visuals and the characters, and, you know, it gets you in the mood, but it really never shows you enough to know anything, and that, I found, was not the case with this last trailer, and it really, really angered me a lot. Yeah, because uh, two things that seem pretty clear, like, it's definitely going to happen, are the death of Princess Leia at the hands of Kylo Ren, because, or one reason being that Carrie Fisher is dead, and they have to organically end her character arc somehow and at the end of the trailer with Rey asking Kylo Ren for help and Kylo Ren offering her a hand it just it kind of shocked me at the end and I'm thinking they wouldn't really show that in the trailer would they unless they're desperate I mean Van Forstick made one of the biggest mistakes by showing everything just about everything in the trailer even though some of what they showed in the trailer didn't turn up in the movie from what I've heard. Yeah, that's true. Like, it, it's funny because a lot of those cool scenes that were in the trailer didn't even make it into the final cut of the movie. But I feel like that's just been a trope with trailers now is that trailers either do one of two things now. They either tell you everything that you're going to see in the movie in the trailer or they either completely deliberately lie to you so that by the time you actually see the movie, you get a completely different product than what you got. And Star Wars, for the most part, I feel like has been hating that perfect happy medium in that it doesn't tell you everything or deliberately lie to you and this was just the first instance where i found that that wasn't the case and that really bugs me because star wars trailers have been really great i've been known for being really great in the past yes that is true and uh, just a little side note from from the background in that final scene in the trailer where ray is asking kylo ren for help i kind of get the impression that that scene is going to take place on a lava planet similar to mustafar in episode three i don't know if it's the film is going to mirror that confrontation or whatnot but and also one thing that confuses me is that the trailer makes it seem like ray is going to turn to the dark side but i've been hearing a lot of rumors that suggest luke will turn to the dark side as well i'm not sure if it's supposed to be both of them or one of them i'm really confused yeah and that that's one of the things that i've actually been confused about as well because the thing the, the big thing that I thought was going to happen in this movie is the fact of Luke disavowed the Jedi Order, not just for the fact of Kylo Ren obviously going dark and destroying his previous Jedi camp, but also for the fact of, again, kind of harping on a lot of the problems with the prequels in that the whole idea of the light and dark side, the Jedi versus the Sith, is kind of BS because if you look at the original themes that were set up in the original Star Wars trilogy... The, just because a character was on the light side didn't necessarily make them all light because, again, the idea of characters just being all good or all evil is really black and white and not relatable in any way, and it's one of the reasons why the prequels failed so hard. And also the ridiculous notion that if you love somebody, you turn to the dark side. Which is just stupid, and George Lucas, why? Just why? Well, he's, he's a, naturally, I've read, a very emotionless man. He probably put a lot of that into the script 
I mean, Marsha Lucas, uh, his ex-wife, uh, certainly had problems with him in that category. I mean, probably the line that, uh, from Phantom Menace, by the way, that sums ev up that whole new idea of loving somebody and being on the dark side is when Yoda tells Anakin, Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. Yeah, it's just, it, it, it's dumb. But the point being that I... I, 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 what I thought was going to happen in this movie is the fact of Luke is kind of dissolving the Jedi Order, you know, when he says it's time for the Jedi to end because he wants to bring a more balanced and idealized version of the Force. It's just like, okay, the Force kind of can't exist with just the light or just the dark side because, again, if the Force has always kind of been a mirror, I feel like, of human beings and the real world in terms of no human being is 100% good or evil. So by dissolving this ridiculous notion of, you know, you know, Jedi all good and being robots and Sith being all evil and being, and being, you know, just for just having a little bit of emotion. I thought that's what this movie was going to play around with. But now the fact of they're turning both Luke and Ray potentially to the dark side, that kind of throws me off a lot. Huh? Yeah. I mean, if you're going to do that, you'll have to, you'll have to do something earlier in the film to earn that moment. And Wow, it's just, I mean, it's Star Wars. I mean, I love the original three films, the pre-special edition ones, by the way. But uh, this, I really don't know what to think of about where the franchise is going. Like, I hear that J.J. Abrams is going to be writing the script for Episode Nine. So, yeah, the point being that, I mean, look, whatever we say, whatever our critiques of over this movie, you know we're going to matter jack shit because everybody is still going to go see this movie because Disney has it and because it's got Star Wars on it. So, again, what we say about anything concerning this movie does not matter. But just know that those are our thoughts on the Star Wars trailer, and we hope it's good. We want it to be good, but we would be lying if we said we weren't a least bit skeptical. Yes, that is true. And one more thought. The Force Awakens, I think, did a good job of covering up the whole midichlorians issue and speaking about the Force in a way where midichlorians really aren't needed. If The Last Jedi mentions anything about midichlorians, I'm going to go crazy. Yeah, midichlorians. Like that. I, and I love that The Force Awakens kind of like left that in the dust, but I oh, just... That line, just hearing Qui-Gon explain, it's just like, you had such a great thing with the Force and how mystical it is, and now you're trying to over-explain it. It's like that whole problem with the prequels is just like making everything connected and trying to over-explain things that don't need to be explained. Well, any prequel could have that problem, Alien Covenant, for instance, but it really doesn't make any sense because... Does having a high percentage of it in your blood mean that you're really powerful with the Force and having a teensy beats, bitsy uh, bit of it in your blood means you can all, the best you can do is maybe lift little pebbles off the ground? Yeah, so... That's our thoughts on the Last Jedi trailer, and kind of our. Oh, that's kind of the end of this segment where we cover a lot of the trailers of the month. Now, like I said, we're going to be getting to our movies that we've seen in the month, and kind of our general topic that we want to talk about for the month of October. That'll be a lot of fun. But first, this is the part of the show where we have to kind of you know cover some real world news and. I feel that with all the news stories and castings and all that, you know, little excess bullshit that kind of pales in comparison to a lot of the really rather shameful things that have come out in mm -hmm. Hollywood in terms of sexual harassment. So sexual harassment has kind of always been a thing that's happened, not just in Hollywood, but really in any workplace situation. True. And the fact that it's, it's always been able to, you know, be, whether it be people have not have ne never take, given it a second glance or whether or not it's just the fact of it's always been done by men in power who have the easy ability to ruin people's lives if anybody says differently and just overall it, se sexual harassment is just not an okay thing at all and the fact that it's people have been get been able to get away for it for so long is just disgusting but the fact of the matter is is that there's some light that's finally being shed on it in Hollywood in particular, and it's really I'm I'm really happy because it finally the these people these disgusting people who've been able to get away with it 
for decades now are finally getting their just due and are finally getting the justice that against them that they deserve. And I feel like we should start by talking about kind of the whole instigator of this thing that's kind of bring out all these sexual har- that's kind of started all this sexual harassment claims and that would of course be Harvey Weinstein. Yeah. So a couple of weeks ago in October, the New York Times and the New Yorker reported that dozens of women um, actresses, producers, a bunch of other people had accused Harvey Weinstein, who was a prominent American film producer, you know, the head of the Weinstein Company, kind of the guy who made Quentin Tarantino the guy who he is now. And Kevin Smith. There's a lot of other directors of sexual harassment, assault, and rape. Many women, um, of course, it came from non consensual sex act of all different kinds. They accused him of, uh, of course, making advances on them. Uh, forcing them into unrecorded sex situations. A couple women even came forward and said they did it with him just so that he wouldn't end up ruining their careers and their lives. And unlike in a lot of previous cases of this sort of thing, there are actually being consequences levied against Mr. Weinstein. He's been fired from the Motion Picture Academy, and now police are trying to conduct criminal charges against him. Which, thank fucking Christ, because this is... It's disgusting. Now, the thing about Weinstein is that I feel like, and what makes him kind of even more gross than all of the other ones is that with Weinstein, it's a situation of, it's kind of been a known thing, at least in inner circles, and kind of one of those things that, like, everybody, you know, it's like the worst kept secret that nobody ever wanted to act on. Like, Tarantino, after the whole thing happened, even came out and said that he had known about it for decades and was ashamed that he hadn't acted on it before, but it's like... This just shows a trend of men in power being able to take advantage of women because they can, and it's not okay. And the fact that they are finally getting their justice is really, really satisfying to hear. Yes, and uh, it is sad to hear a bunch of Hollywood people come out and say that they knew about this sort of thing, but they did nothing about it. I mean, apologizing for it is one thing, but... Making up for it is another. I mean, even though Kevin Smith didn't know about this whole thing, he is donating all the money he made from his career with Weinstein to charity organizations for women. And that is just a a happy thing to hear about, like actually contributing that blood money or dirty money to something that's good. Pretty much. Now, I have a list here of some of the actresses and just people in Hollywood who have come forward about um, Harvey Weinstein. Some of these you may, you guys may know, some of them you may not, but just I feel like the, these actresses, it, it deserves to be known. Like Just to show you how many people were affected by this and just the fact of it, it really was, there was like no so on in turn. So um, Amber Anderson, Lisette Anthony, Asia Argento, Rosanna Arquette, Jessica Barth, Kate Beckinsale, Zoe Brock, Jules Bindi, Cynthia Burr, Liza Campbell, Marissa Coughlin, Emma DeCon, Hope Exner Demore, Florence Durrell, Cara Delevingne, Pase Lohertov, Juliana De Paola, Sophia Dix, Lacey Dorn, Don Dunning, Lena Esco, Alice Evans, Lucia Evans, Angie Everhart, Claire Forlani, Romola Garay, Louisette Geis, Luis Godbold, Judith Godrek, Trish Gaff, Eva Green, Amber Gutierrez, Mimi Hale- Halei, I think, Daryl Hannah, Lena Headey, Lauren Holly, Dominique Couette, Angelina Jolie, Ashley Judd, Minka Kelly, Catherine Kendall, Heather Kerr, Mia Kirshner, Mylene Class, Laura Madden, Nat- Natasha Mouth, Juliana Margulis, Britt Marling, Sarah Ann Mass, Ashley Mathau, Rose McGowan, Natalie Mendoza, Sophie Morris, Katya, uh, I'm not even going to try and touch that last name, Mzit. Z- Torridze, I think. Emily Nestor, Jennifer Seibel Newsom, Connie Nielsen, Lupita Nyongo, Lauren O'Connor, Gwyneth Paltrow, Samantha Panagrosso, Zelda Perkins, Vuthu Fuang, Sarah Polly, Tommy Ann Roberts, Lisa Rose, Erica Rosenbaum, Melissa Sage Miller, Annabella Shiora, Leia Sidhu, Lauren Sivan, Chelsea Skidmore, Mira Sorvino, Tara Subkoff, Paula Wachowiak, Paula Williams, Sean Young, and at least half of those came forward and said that. Um, Weinstein deliberately raped them so just absolutely disgusting absolutely gross and I am Harvey Weinstein if you are listening which I can't imagine that you would be but if you are you should just go and slit your wrists right now because the fact that you would do this and the fact that you would 
take advantage of so many actresses who are just trying to make a name for themselves and, you know, do what they love and express themselves artistically. And the fact that you would take advantage of them in just the worst possible way is, it, it, it just, you, you are like the epitome of everything that is wrong with the human race as of right now. And I hope to Christ that you get the absolute worst that the justice system can deliver. Yes, I always knew you were an asshole. I've heard about all the arguments you've had with directors like Martin Scorsese when making Gangs of New York, but I never thought you would actually be capable of such behavior. I mean, Jesus, this is... God, this is even worse than some of the stuff that went on in the golden age, like Judy Garland, I hear, suffered pretty horribly, but that's beside the, that's not beside the point, but, but anyway, Mr. Weinstein, you, you're a monster, and, God, I, you are, I, yeah, I can't Lower than anything. scum, literally lower than scum, like, you are... Yeah, I, I don't think I, I don't even want to talk about you anymore, just because of just just how angry the thought of a person like you in the position that you've been in for years now makes me. So, we'll we'll we'll, we'll stop talking about Weinstein for now, just because again, it's just, it's an issue that's been talked to to death at this point, but it needs to be kept talking about because there, if there's one thing that needs to be stressed nonstop, it is that sexual harassment in any kind of workplace, not just in Hollywood, but in any kind of workplace, is not okay at all and the next person that we're going to talk about is kind of another example of that because this is a person who unlike Weinstein actually tried to come out and apologize for some of his actions and needless to say probably went about it in the worst way possible and did not help himself even a little bit and that would be Kevin Spacey so one of the most shocking at least for me because besides from being a great actor he seemed like a nice person out outside of the movies and television so my God, I was, I, I didn't know what to think after that. So basically, the story goes. Now I'm pulling it up now so that I can kind of, you know, re really deliver some serious perspective on it. And it's that Kevin. So uh, one of the new actors on the brand new Star Trek TV series on CBS All Access, his name is Anthony Rapp, came forward and uh, about I think it was like a week after the whole Weinstein situation broke and he alleged that well more than a week yeah more, more than a week after but he alleged that in 1986 when rap was only 14 years old spacey while appearing drunk made a sexual advance towards him now spacey responded to the allegations against him on twitter and stated that of course he was sorry and that if he did make an advance towards rap he would have been drunk but then he tries to overlay it by coming out as gay now that really is, he, he may have been trying to help himself out, but in the long run, he really just kind of screwed himself even further because trying to cover up the fact that you sexually assaulted, not, not like, here's the thing, as disgusting as what Weinstein did, at least all of those women were adults, so even though rape is horrible and I'm not advocating for it in any way, at the very least, they were adults. But with Spacey, what kind of makes his actions even more despicable is the fact of this is a child, not even a 16-year-old, so at least age of consent, a 14-year-old kid. And the fact of he tries to cover it up by kind of just saying, oh, yeah, I kind of, you know, assaulted a kid while I was drunk, and by the way, I'm gay. That's total bullshit, and it really, it, it, it just, he was only screwing himself further, so... Basically, all sense of, it's, it's, of course, since rap, a bunch of other people have come out and said that Spacey had um, made advances toward them, including uh, you have journalist Heather Unruh, filmmaker Tony Montana, actor Roberto Cavazos, and also Richard Dreyfuss' son Harry, apparently, as well as eight people who worked with the actor on the critically acclaimed Netflix series that he's been working on for the past five years now, House of Cards. And uh, what... Spacey said clearly didn't help him career-wise because House of Cards is doing its last season now, and he's been he's been fired from the show. And now it's a fact that they may not. They, House of Cards literally doesn't even know what to do because so the way that it went was as soon as the allegations dropped, House of Cards released a statement that they, their next season they were they were going to do because they just released their fifth season uh, back in May that their next season their sixth season was going to be their final season. But then they probably really took a step back and thought about it and they said, okay, we really don't know what to do here. So they put it on production halt. 
And now Spacey has officially been fired from the show. Netflix has no idea what the future is going to be. There have been talk about spinoffs. There's been talk about potentially killing his character off in the sixth and final season. But the point being, the entire future of House of Cards is completely up in the air now. The point being that Spacey is no longer with the show. And in addition to that, in terms of just his movie career, um, Kevin Spacey is also kind of screwed because he was set to appear as J. Paul Getty in Ridley Scott's next movie, which was supposed to be a major Oscar contender called All the Money in the World, in which Spacey played, uh, again, J. Paul Getty, the major oil magnet whose grandson was kidnapped and uh, he was sent blackmail messages. The movie is also set to star Michelle Williams and Mark Wahlberg. Ridley Scott, who, as you know, has been kind of hit or miss at this point with um, directing wise, but the mo the movie the Sony was going to plan the movie's Oscar campaign around pitching Spacey for supporting, but that is no longer a thing now. Spacey is n at, completely out of the Oscar race; like they are not acknowledging him, and they're going to focus more of the career race around Michelle Williams and Mark Wahlberg. But yeah, it's just it's again it's sad, and it comes as a shock to me personally because Kevin Spacey has been one of the best actors that I've seen in films over the past ten years, and it kind of shines a whole new light on it because again, Kevin Spacey is one of my favorite performers and also appeared in one of my favorite movies of all time, that being The Usual Suspects, which won him his first Oscar. And just, it, it, it's sad because you have these idols, these people in the business that you look up to, who you look at as your role models, you know, as young aspiring artists and knowing now what they're capable of, it's, it, it's hurtful. It, it's very, very, very hurtful. And uh, I should probably know because I've, read about stories similar to this even last year like for instance uh, last tango in paris that was a controversial film from 1972 starring marlon brando and a 19 year old maria schneider and it was very controversial for its uh, depictions of sex and the fact that it was a man in his late 40s having sex with a with a 19 year old girl but the story that really shocked me was reading that director Bernardo Bernardo Bertolucci. Bertolucci, yeah, he he thought about doing this one scene, a famous scene involving butter, where where he would use butter as a lubricant for sex between Brando and Schneider. Brando knew about it, but neither of them bothered to tell Schneider. And as a result, Schneider felt raped by the whole thing. She said that there wasn't actual, actually any sex, but it left her feeling, feeling bad. And, and she's pretty much stayed away from the movies, mostly after that. The point being that it's just, it's, it's a real sad state of affairs, the fact that these types of people have been able to get away with this for so long now. And it's, it, it, it's really... It, it, it's really assuring to me to see that this it's finally it seems that these people are getting the justice that they deserve in terms of that there really isn't any sort of tolerance for this now and yeah that's really all that I want to talk about it because I just feel sick to my stomach and sad and disgusted knowing that th these people are out there and finally and are still being able to get away with it every single day so the point being that I guess my message now is to any woman or anybody, not just women, because if Anthony Rapp's situation shows it's that men are just as big victims for this as women are. It's that if you feel that you're in a situation where you are being harassed in any way, not necessarily just sexually, but in any way, um, don't be afraid to speak out because the environment that we live in now and just the overall, just, just the, the overall not just workplace environment, but the world that we live in has changed and is changing for the better. So if you feel that there that you are in a situation like this in any way, speak up about it because you will find that you might ha you're going to have a lot more support than you previously thought. You don't need to be afraid. People, there are people who will listen. So that's our that's the end of this kind of uh, first segment of the show. So we are now going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we are going to. You know what? We'll leave that for a surprise. We'll let you know what we're going to do when we get back. So, see ya. <laughs> 